Hi, in this lecture I'm going to be talking about the trace operator and what it means to take the trace of a matrix as well as uh, just a few properties and applications of the trace operator because the trace operator itself is pretty simple. This goes to chapter 2.10 of the deep learning textbook so I suggest you read that after watching this lecture. Okay, so let's get into it. So we'll cover the trace operator definition in the first like 30 seconds, but it's pretty simple. Basically to take the trace of a matrix is to take the sum of its diagonal elements. So for example, we have some matrix A. To take the sum of its diagonal elements, say we have some A, you know, let's actually do some numerical example, five, six, three, two, one, one, two, six, nine. I said nine, but wrote eight. All right, so say we have this matrix here. If we want to take the trace of this matrix, we'd signify that with the notation TR of A, so that's the trace of A, is equal to the sum of its diagonal elements. That'd be five plus one plus eight, so that'd be 14. So the trace of this matrix is 14. Simple enough, and it gets simpler when you realize that uh, the trace operator is only defined for square matrices, so you don't need to worry about what taking the trace of a rectangular matrix is, because that uh, isn't allowed to happen. Uh, maybe the most interesting case is when you have a one by one matrix, aka a scalar. So if you have some six, say, uh, in this case, you can think of it as a one by one matrix with one element. And you can almost think of that one element as being a diagonal element. So if you take the trace of the number six, you just get back six. So in general, when you're taking the trace of a scalar, you just get that scalar back. Okay, good. Definition done. Let's talk about a few applications. Well, one application. Uh, one example of an application, and then a few properties. So the trace operator is often used to simplify notation, because without it we'd often have to resort to using large amounts of summation, and which is kind of clunky and a little ugly and hard to read. So let's uh, give a good example of this. So a good example of this would be um, in simplifying the notation for the Frobenius norm, which is uh, we encountered it first in chapter 2.5 when he first introduced norms, but it's basically how we can take the uh, size of a matrix. So I'll give a quick review. Say we have some matrix A to take the Frobenius norm. So let's say it has elements A, B, C, and D. If we want to take the Frobenius norm, we'd basically square each of the elements and then add them and then take the square root of that, and that'd give us a number that tells us the size of that matrix. So we say the Frobenius norm, that's the symbol used for the Frobenius norm, is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. And that would give us a number that gives us the size of this matrix. So it can kind of be thought as the matrix version of the L2 norm. The general notation for the Frobenius norm is clunky though, because uh, you kind of have to somehow use summation to say L, uh, indexing over all the elements in a matrix, which is kind of hard to define mathematically. Uh, but the general notation is if we, for any matrix A, the Frobenius norm of that matrix is the square root of the summation of I, J, uh, for, so we're indexing to that, so for all the elements, so we basically say we sum over all the possible A, I, J's, and then we square each of those, and then we add them, and then we take the square root of that, and this is the definition of our Frobenius norm which as you can see is a bit clunky, right? Let's Frobenius norm. This is a bit clunky. It's, you know, we got that summation there. This is kind of informal definition really because if you have a rectangular matrix, uh, the I and the J's go up to different, uh, you know, they go up to different max numbers because you might have more rows and columns. So what does this even index to? It's a bit confusing and it's a bit informal and it's a bit ugly. Uh, but we can actually use a much, much, much nicer uh, formula for this by using the trace. So that formula is the trace, um, so sorry, I was <laughs> cutting to the chase there. So the Frobenius norm of some matrix A, we can also say is equal to the square root of the trace of A, A transpose. Isn't that nice? But it might seem a little out of the blue, so let's do this exact same example here and see if we get this same answer for it that we got with this formula. So let's do that. So let's, I'm gonna turn that square root into a fractional power because it's easier to write. And then we have the trace of AA transpose and let's use this example here. So we're gonna get some A, B, C, D. And we're gonna multiply this by its transpose. That's gonna be some A, C, B, D. And then we're gonna do that. And then we're gonna do that fractional power. Okay, great, so let's multiply these matrices out. And since I'm lazy, 
I'm just going to find the diagonal elements of its product just because the non-diagonal elements won't matter because we're taking the trace. So let's just find the first element and then the last element. So we're going to do the first row with the first, that was a slack notification. We're going to do the first row with the first column. So that's going to be some a squared plus b squared, right? And then we're going to do whatever. We don't care about that one. We don't care about this one. Let's do the last element over here. So that'd be the last row with the last column. So that'd be c squared plus d squared. So that's going to be some c squared plus d squared. So we don't care about the off diagonal stuff. And then that fractional power. So now we take the trace of this, and again, we didn't care about the off diagonal, so we just add the, this thing is on the diagonal, right? So it'd be a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. So that's going to be some a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. And then with that fractional power, and of course that fractional power can just be written as the square root. And then notice that's the exact same thing that we got here. So this definition works for this example at least, and hopefully you can convince yourself that that uh, formula works for all size matrices, rectangular or non-rectangular, because even though you can't take the trace of a non-square matrix, uh, AA transpose is always going to be a square matrix. Okay, so that's a quick little application of the, of the um, trace operator, but let's talk about a few nice properties of it. Uh, the first one is pretty easy, but the second one is a bit complex. But overall, this is a pretty nice non-brain hurdy lecture. Okay, so uh, good. Well, I guess the first property of the trace operator is pretty simple, and that property is, is that it's called its transpose invariant, which sounds super fancy, but it's just it's extremely simple. So if we have some trace of some matrix A, it's equal to the trace of that matrix A transpose, uh, because when you transpose a matrix, the diagonal elements stay stationary, that's you know, super simple example, say A, B, C, D. When you transpose this, we get uh, A, C, B, D, right? But I notice the diagonal elements are still A, D, and A, D, and that applies for any square matrices. Of course, with rectangular matrices, you flip the thing, so of course it's going to be different, but when you're taking the trace, we can't even take the trace of rectangular matrices, so we don't have to worry about that. So when A is a square matrix, uh, this holds true. Okay, so that's the first kind of important thing to know about tr uh, the trace operator. But the second thing is a bit more specific and a little wonky, but it's a good thing to know. And it's called, uh, and I guess to state it, is that the trace operator is cyclically invariant. So it's, my, it's a bit of a mouthful and it's a bit of a weird concept to digest, but let's see. So say we have some, say we have four matrices, A, B, C, D. So we have four matrices A, B, C, and D. Just to keep things easy, let's say these are all square and all the same dimension, so all M by M. All M by M. This way, these can all be multiplied together in any order, right? If these are all M by M, you can just multiply them in any order and you get any square matrix, so it doesn't really matter. So if we have through four matrices A, B, C, and D, and they're all square M by M matrices, if we take the trace of A, B, C, D. So this is going to be some product, right? Because we're taking these four M by M things. So this is going to end up being some M by M matrix, right? So if we take the trace of this matrix, which is possible, so this is going to be square, that is going to be equal to the trace of the same product, except that we bring this D to the front. If we bring this D to the front and we multiply them in a slightly different order where the D is at the front and we shift everything else to the right. Since matrix multiplication is not uh, commutative, A, B, C, D, and D, A, B, C are different matrices. But the traces of them are equal because we cycled this D from the front to the back of the product. And let's, let's go another round. So the trace of that and is equal to if we bring the C to the front and we get C, D, A, B, and then we kind of, you know, we shift everything and we cycle it through, right? So we have C, D, A, B. And again, we can cycle it through one more time. So these are all equal to, if we bring this B to the front and we get some B, C, D, A. And notice if we bring that A back to the front again, we're left with this. So these four are equal. And that's because they are just the same product, but we cycle each of the little product, each of the little things in the product through. Right? If we were to just put them in a random order, if we were just to shuffle these matrices in a random order, say we have some 
I don't know, uh, D, B, C, A. If we wanted to take the trace of this matrix product D, B, C, A, this would not be equal to any of these because you can't obtain this kind of sequence by uh, cycling these through. Notice that uh, the one we start with D is D, A, B, C. So there's no way we can cycle these around and get D, B, C, A. So this trace is not going to be equal to all of these. This trace would be equal to something if we cycled these around. So if we got, we put this A and we put it at the front and we got some A, D, B, C, these two would be equal, but these two would not be equal to these. Um, so that's why we call it cyclically invariant, because or cyclically invariant. It's because if we have a product of matrices, if we cycle the matrices around in kind of, you know, like a cycly way, then uh, the traces are exactly the same. But if we shuffle them around in any given order, they are not the same. So that's just an important thing to know. That's a little more maybe weird, a little, yeah, a little weird. But um, I guess maybe the general notation, and this shows up in the book, so it's a good thing to know. The general notation to kind of state the cyclic invariance is uh, as follows. So the trace of some, use the uppercase pi to kind of, as the uh, multiplication version of the summation notation kind of, right? So up to some n i of, let's say f is our matrix, f of i is equal to the trace of f of n times n minus 1 i f i. So this might be a little scary, but it's pretty clear what it means. So basically it says that the trace of this sequence, so this is some f i, so f i up to f n, so it's going to be f 1, f 2, f 3, f 4, so it's going to be some product f 1, f 2, f 3, up to f 4 n, right? That's basically what this is saying. The trace of this matrix product of f1, f2, f3, f4 up to fn is the same as the trace if we brought the last element in the sequence, so fn, to the front, right, before all of this, and then we just started after that, right? So that's the exact same thing as we were saying, right? We just bring the last element to the front, and then we multiply everything else. Hopefully that makes sense. And um, that's about it. That about covers the trace operator. Uh, this was kind of a simpler lecture, but it's just a good thing to know, and it'll show up all the time, so it's good to know. All right, see you in the next lecture.